Well, please take the Word of God and turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 32. And as you're turning there, may I say, I'm so glad to be home. My wife and I are so thankful to be back and see so many friends and our Christian family. And it's been a wonderful time to spend a bit of time with my wife's family and now my family as well. And we're so thankful to be here. We look forward to seeing you throughout the week and getting to speak to you. And we've been so encouraged and so blessed to be back here at our home church, Temple Baptist Church. Amen. We've enjoyed some very good food since we've been back. We haven't been to Taco Bell yet, but we, we hope to get there as soon as possible. And it's strange the things you miss when you're in England. My wife and I, late at night, we'll sit up and think about things like Taco Bell. And I, I don't know why I didn't like it all that much when I lived here, but now that we're away, we miss it. And we miss, most of all, you. And we're so thankful to be back. Please pray for us. Your prayers are working. God is at work in England. I bring you greetings from Beaches Road Baptist Chapel in the Birmingham area and Oxford Baptist Chapel and the brand new Brighton's West Hill Baptist Chapel. Amen. And we're thankful for what God is doing. And that's just the beginning. We trust that God is at work and many more good things will happen in the days to come. And so we're so thankful for what God has done through you and the work and sacrifice you've made to see that work in the United Kingdom go forward. Well, I trust you've found your place in the book of Jeremiah and chapter 32. Let's begin reading in verse 1. We'll read our text to the end of verse 15. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison which was in the king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah king of Judah had shut him up saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall take it. And Zedekiah king of Judah shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him mouth to mouth and his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though ye fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anatoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anatoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine, buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, that was in Anatoth. And weighed him the money, even seventeen shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it. And took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed, according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Maasiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase." Before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I charged Baruch before them saying. Thus shall the Lord of hosts the God of Israel. Take these evidences. This evidence of the purchase both which is sealed. And this evidence which is open. And put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. For thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel. Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. I'd invite you to turn with me to verse 27 from which we'll take our title and our theme for the message this morning. Verse 27 of chapter 32. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? God has a question for you this morning. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? With God's help this morning, I'd like to look at this passage, an amazing passage, a bit of an obscure passage. 
And I believe that there are some wonderful things, some truths, some applications we can make to our situation today. No doubt this passage must be interpreted in a prophetic light. This passage would be taking place in years to come from the time that Jeremiah, by the Holy Spirit, penned it. But we could make some applications today to our situation we find ourselves in in this country. And with God's help, I hope to make some simple applications to the condition of the United Kingdom and to give a bit of a report on what God is doing there in England. And may God help us as we look. This is the darkest time in Judah's history. The ten tribes of Israel to the north have already been besieged and carried away. And now Judah, Benjamin, and Judah, these two tribes of the south surrounding Jerusalem, are now surrounded by the enemy, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. The puppet king Zedekiah who had been placed in power by the Babylonian king had now rebelled against Babylon and the Babylonians had come to surround the city. Everything in Judah except Jerusalem is now under the control of the enemy and there is great destruction. The Bible tells us that there's so much oppression, there's disease, there's the sword, there's famine and there's so many dark things. Judah is under the judgment of God. And what can be done? It's a dark day, but there's hope in a dark day. First of all, I'd like you to notice with me the opposition that Jeremiah faced. I've read several times and it's always a help to me. And I know I've mentioned this here before, but it speaks to me and helps me and encourages me so much. Hudson Taylor said, there are always three steps in any work that ever glorifies God. The first step is impossible. The second step is difficult. The third step is done. And may God help us understand that God desires a work that will glorify Him. And many times that work seems to be to everyone else impossible. But I have a question for you. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Notice the opposition that Jeremiah faced in the country. Notice verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. At one time, Judah was a, a group of people who followed after the Lord. Though Israel had forsaken God, Judah and their kings had followed God, but no more. Judah now had begun to worship other gods, and it found itself in Jerusalem, the capital city, surrounded by the Babylonians and ready to be taken. We can think of a very similar situation in the United Kingdom for many years, it was the missionary sending capital of the world and missionaries were sent all around the planet because Great Britain was indeed Great Britain. A visiting ruler came to visit Queen Victoria in the 1800s and he asked, what makes Great Britain great? And she reached for a book that she always kept nearby and she handed it to the ruler and it was a Bible. Amen. And she said, this is the secret of Britain's Greatness. Sixty years ago, over 60% of children 14 years of age and under went to Sunday school every week. Today, less than 1% of children go anywhere to Sunday school. The country of Judah had changed. The United Kingdom has changed. In Europe, the United Kingdom once had the highest church attendance percentage of any country, not only in Europe, but of the world. Today, there are more percentages of people attending church in Hungary and Slovenia and Lithuania and Latvia and the Czech Republic than people who attend church in the United Kingdom. Things have changed. Notice... The city, verse 2, then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the great, Jerusalem, the beautiful. When the queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon and saw Jerusalem in its splendor, she said, of all the things she'd been told, the half has not been told of all the wonderful beauty of Jerusalem. And yet Jeremiah will write in Lamentations chapter 2, when Jerusalem faces its destructions, they hiss in verse 15 of Lamentations 2, they wag their heads saying, Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty? The joy of the whole earth? And Jerusalem now is not a beautiful city. It's a besieged city. It's a place surrounded by the enemy and there's no hope of deliverance. I think of the great cities of the United Kingdom. Birmingham at one time from the 1680s all the way into the 1800s was a hotbed for nonconformist 
biblical Christianity. There are more Baptist chapels in Birmingham than any other part of the United Kingdom per capita. Birmingham was a place where the gospel was preached. But today the fastest growing religion in Birmingham is Islam. The largest Sikh temple in Europe is in Birmingham. The largest population of Hindus outside of the Indian subcontinent is in Birmingham. Traveled with me down the road about an hour and a half to the city of Oxford. Oxford, the place where Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley gave their lives for the cause of the gospel. Where they were burned at the stake because they believed the truth about Christ and salvation by grace through faith. Hugh Latimer said as he was burning at the stake to his partner Nicholas Ridley. We shall this day light it such a candle in England as I trust by God's grace shall never be put out. That Oxford where John Wesley and his brother Charles and a young frail man named George Whitfield knelt in the ground outside of their student housing with their faces in the dirt every morning before sunup to pray that God would do something in England. That Oxford, would you like to know the newest part of Oxford University? It's a beautiful new complex. It's called the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. And His Royal Highness Prince Charles came to dedicate this wonderful new building, a huge building, a complex built for Islamic studies. And His Royal Highness said this, the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies has done so much to promote and improve our much needed understanding of the Islamic world. The United Kingdom has changed. Brighton was a wonderful place. A, a man who was named Henry Varley spoke to a man you would recognize named D.L. Moody. And in Brighton, before D.L. Moody was to take his trip back to America... Henry Varley said to D.L. Moody, the world has yet to see what God will do with one man who is fully consecrated to him. And D.L. Moody said, that one phrase changed my entire ministry. And that happened in Brighton. On June 25th, 1865, a young man was in a Baptist church and as the last hymn of the service was sung, his heart was so full of reaching people with the gospel, he ran out of the church service down the hill onto Brighton Beach. And he wrote in the flyleaf of his Bible, I will by God's grace reach China. And that young man, Hudson Taylor, that day began the China Inland Mission in Brighton. Amen. But today Brighton is called Sin City. It's the most sexually perverse area in the United Kingdom, perhaps in all of Europe. It's a place where people go for immorality and it's well known throughout the United Kingdom to be a place of perversity. Things have changed. The cities, like Jerusalem, have changed. But notice the condition of Jeremiah. The Bible tells us at the end of verse 2, he was shut up in the king's prison. Verse 3, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy? And here is Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God had ordained Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations. But now Jeremiah is in prison. And God's people are being persecuted. I think of people in Great Britain... The place that William Carey and Hudson Taylor and Robert Morrison and Henry Moffat and William Patton and Gladys Allward and Amy Carmichael came from. Those missionaries. And yet today, people are fined. People are fired from their jobs just for proclaiming that they're Christians. In Birmingham, a man named Arthur and another man named Joseph were handing out gospel tracts in an Islamic area community support officer came and told them they couldn't hand out hate literature and if they continued to do so they would be arrested and fined and they would eventually be beaten up by people in that community and there would be nothing to stop them. They'd be no help. There'd be no help for them. You see, the United Kingdom has changed very, very much. There's so many things that have changed. What should we do? Should we stop here? Should we turn out the lights and say, it's too hard and the cost is too high and there's really nothing that can be done? And after all, things are the way they are. Should we stop there? Some people do. And there are some discouraged believers who have come to the conclusion that there are some things that are too hard for the Lord. I have a question for you. Is anything too hard for the Lord I believe that there is something that God is doing in dark days. He's offering hope. Amen. 
I can, from time to time, speak at a meeting and an older person will come to me and, and almost pat me on the head as if it were to say, I used to be young like you and I used to think something could happen, but I've long since quit believing that. And I, I think you're a nice, naive, young, inexperienced man, but I don't believe it can happen anymore. May God help me always be young and naive and inexperienced enough to believe God is still able to do something. Something. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? The second thing I'd like you to notice is the opportunity Jeremiah saw. In darkness, in a surrounded city with no way of escape, Jeremiah saw an opportunity. And I want you to notice quickly with me, God is still speaking. Verse 6, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me in dark days. The word of God, by the way, is still speaking. God still speaks, and he speaks to us through his word. His unchanging word still speaks. Notice the purchase that Jeremiah has spoken to about. Verse 7, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anatoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said unto me, By my field I pray thee that is in Anatoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. There is a purchase that is made. This is a town of Anatoth. It is three miles north of Jerusalem and it is currently besieged by Chaldeans, by the Babylonians. It's owned by this man, but it's used and controlled by the enemy. It is worthless. It's not worth buying. Jeremiah couldn't use it. He couldn't plow it. He couldn't sell it because it's under the siege of the Babylonians. And yet God speaks to him and says, buy this property. This is the worst time for Jeremiah to be buying real estate. He's in prison. But I see God speaking, saying to Jeremiah, I want you to do something no one else is going to understand, but I want you to do it. And I want you to notice the perspective Jeremiah has. The Bible says in verse 8 at the end of the verse, Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Do you see God's glory in dark days? Jeremiah was a man, even in the darkest time of Judah's history, he could see there is a God who is able to do all things and there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And I'm going to buy this piece of property. I don't understand all the reasons why. And I can't use it, but God told me to do it. And so I'm going to do something that is not fiscally responsible. It is not going to be uh, something that makes common sense to many other people, but I'm going to do it because the word of the Lord came to me saying, buy the property. The perspective he had. This was a purchase of faith. Notice verse 15. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. This was a down payment of faith. Jeremiah was doing something to say God is again going to do something and there will be many people someday who will own land and people who will plant vineyards and many wonderful things will happen again in this land. This was a purchase of faith. And he purchased the land. You know, strange things happen. Our pastor received a phone call from a man he'd never met who said, we have an empty building here in Birmingham. Would you be willing to consider taking it? I've heard that man many times say he never heard such a short converse, phone conversation in all his life. Pastor Sexton said, we'll take it. I had no idea why. Until now. A man rang us and said, there's a place in Oxford. It's, it's empty and you'll probably never get it. But would you pray about, think about maybe taking a place in Oxford, an empty chapel? And we said, well, by God's grace, we'll, we'll take that. A, a phone call came to us from Brighton. And a man said, I've heard what's happened at Beaches Road. I've heard what's happened in Oxford. Would you be interested in an empty chapel in Brighton? And by God's grace... We're seeing something done. May I tell you, 35 chapels close every two weeks in England. 5,000 and some churches since my wife and I have arrived in England have closed and have been sold off. And people are selling them and closing them. And someone said, take this chapel. 
take that chapel, take this church building and do something with it. I'm saying God is still speaking today and he's still looking for people who believe nothing is impossible with him. And there's nothing too hard for the Lord. God is at work. And when it doesn't seem to make sense, it goes in fact against the grain of normality and everyone thinks it's strange. God is still at work. This was a purchase of faith. And may I say to you in the city of Birmingham today, just in the outskirts, a, a little area called Blackheath, there are people meeting today, hearing the gospel. This past week we had our holiday Bible club. We had people come to know Christ as their Savior, make professions of faith. God is at work in Beaches Road. At Oxford this week, there are people from Japan and Korea and England and gypsies coming from all around the area who are hearing the gospel and people are being saved and baptized and going forward with the Lord. And just on Easter Sunday... We had the very first service at the church in Brighton. Brighton's West Hill Baptist Chapel. God is at work in Brighton. You see, there are dark days, yes, but there's hope because God is still speaking through his word. And he wants people to believe there's nothing too hard for him. Well, that was his perspective, but it led to sacrifice. Their sacrifice, if we're going to see what God will do, their sacrifice. I think of a an elderly couple named Eric and Gina. He had been a pastor for many years. And because of health, they're now in their 80s. They live 45 minutes to an hour away from the church they once pastored. But they had such a burden for this chapel building. Every Sunday they could, they'd, they'd travel that long distance. They'd open up the front doors of the chapel. They'd put out the hymn books, put out the Bibles, turn on the lights, clean everything just right. And they'd sing a hymn. They'd try to invite people off the street. Not, not many people usually came. They'd have a scripture reading. He would say a few words. They'd sing another hymn. And every Sunday they could, they'd do that just to keep the doors open. Just a couple people. No doubt somebody said, Eric, why are you paying the insurance on an empty building? You're a trustee. There are only two other trustees. Why are you doing that? Couldn't you just sell it and be done with it? Why are you paying a gas bill and an electrical bill? But Eric and Gina believed something. They believed that nothing is too hard for the Lord. And they kept praying and praying and asking and trusting and believing and hoping. And on Good Friday, Eric and Gina were seated as we had the dedication service. At the chapel, they worked very hard and prayed very hard to keep open at Brighton. You see, there is sacrifice. And Jeremiah did something. Verse 9 tells us, And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money and the balances. It took something for Jeremiah to purchase this property. And 17 shekels of silver in a day of famine and a day of siege was no small amount of money. In fact, many Bible commentators say this was probably the very amount of money that it would have taken to purchase Jeremiah's freedom out of prison. And he gave up perhaps his own freedom to purchase this property. It took sacrifice. I think of a lady who'd be embarrassed if I said her name. But she cleaned oh, about 10 years ago a chapel every week. She'd bring her sister sometimes and her children other times. And she'd vacuum and wash the windows and dust everything. She'd bring her son. And at that time, about 10 years ago, her teenage son would come and clean and then play the pipe organ. He liked to play on the pipe organ. And he'd think and perhaps said a few times to his mom, Why do we come here every week and clean this empty church? Nobody's here. Nobody uses it. Why do we come every week and vacuum the carpets and wash the windows when nobody ever uses this empty church? And that lady kept coming and kept hoping and kept believing something's going to happen here. And this afternoon, that lady will be seated in that chapel, but she'll not be by herself. There'll be other people there hearing the gospel. And her son that used to wonder what will ever happen will be welcoming scores of children into the Sunday school. You see, now he's the Sunday school superintendent at Beaches Road Baptist Chapel. And they sacrificed and prayed and paid a price. But they believed that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Amen. And God is at work. And I want you to know in your own personal life with people you know and you think they'll never be saved and they're too far gone. And there's no hope for them. I have a question for you. Is anything too hard for the Lord? That was a great sacrifice. 
Would you help us pray that by the end of this year we'll see a, another church building that we'll be able to be in? It will take some sacrifice. May I say to you, thank you for praying. You've prayed for us and sacrificially done so and your prayers are working. May I say thank you from the bottom of our hearts and all those who work in England. Thank you for your sacrificial giving. Your sacrificial giving is making a difference and the gospel is going forth. We're not spending it on frivolities. We're spending it on getting the gospel to people who need it. Thank you for sacrificing. There's such a wonderful truth here. We have a message, don't we? If we didn't have a message, let's turn off the lights, lock the doors, and sell everything we have. But we have a message. And the third thing I'd like to bring your attention to this, this morning is the obligation that Jeremiah had. To believe that there is nothing too hard for the Lord is our obligation. And we have a message. And in this passage, I find the message of the gospel. You see... A message should run to the cross as quickly as possible, and I've taken a while to do it, but there's something in this passage about the gospel. In every book of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, there's a scarlet thread of the redemption and the work of Christ, and Jeremiah is no exception, and this chapter is no exception. I see here a wonderful picture of what Christ has done for us. Notice with me in verse 7. Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is an Anatoth, I see here a picture of the sinner. Anatoth was three miles north of Jerusalem. As I mentioned, it was under the siege of the enemy and it had no value or worth in itself. It was set aside and created by God to be a city of refuge, a place of peace for those who had done wrong, but had long since become a cesspit of sin. Anatoth not only was a city of refuge, it was a city of the Levites. The priestly line was from there. It was a city of the Levites. The Bible tells us that in Anatoth, that was the hometown of Jeremiah. That's where Jeremiah came from. He was going to be buying a parcel in his own hometown. And yet the Bible goes on to tell us back in Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 21 through 23, that the people of Anatoth, when Jeremiah prophesied to them, sought after him to kill him. And they said, if you prophesy anymore, we will take your life. What a picture of us. Rebels against God. Those who did not want God or need God or believe there was anything about God that was appealing to us. Sinners, rebels against a holy, righteous, pure God. There's a picture of sinners there in Anatoth. But there's a prophecy also of the Savior. Notice, if you would please, the Bible tells us in verse 8, by my field, I pray thee, that is in Anatoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking here to a prophet, a prophet Jeremiah. And that prophet is a man who knows the truth and hears from God. He's not only a prophet, but he's from a Levite city. He is of the priestly line. I want you to fast forward in your mind with me about 620 some years into the future and stay in Jerusalem and visit another prison cell not far from this one and see with me there in that prison cell a man, a prophet and see him grieving over what has happened to Jerusalem. See him weep and shed bitter tears over this city called Jerusalem. And then look again and see not only a prophet, but see a priest. Oh, it's the same man. He's a prophet and he's a priest. No, he's not of the tribe of Levi, but he's a priest nonetheless. And then take another look and see. He is not only a prophet and he is not only a priest. He is also a king. He's the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He is the Lord Jesus Christ and he is in prison. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us he was taken from prison and from judgment. And the Lord Jesus Christ did something. He heard the voice of his father. As Jeremiah heard the voice of God speak to him, the right of inheritance is thine and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. And the Lord Jesus Christ stood and he paid the redemption price 
far more than 17 pieces of silver, his own precious blood as he hung on the cross and bled and died for you and I. And the price of our redemption was paid in full because Jesus Christ, the prophet, the priest, the king, paid our price. What a, what a wonderful passage. What a wonderful Savior. Jesus Christ is our Savior. And I see not only a picture of the Savior, but a provision of salvation. Verse 9 tells us, And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money. Verse 11, So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. What a picture of salvation. The Savior rose to pay that great price for my worthless soul. I was like Anatoth. I was under the siege of the enemy, worth nothing. And the Savior gave his life for me. Amen. And then something happened. The Bible tells us here that the evidence of the purchase was taken. It was written in a book. And it was sealed. What a wonderful picture of salvation. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. My name's been written in the book of life. And it shall never be erased. And there's a picture here, a prefigure of the Holy Spirit. Would you notice with me? Verse 12. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase, before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may continue many days. The Holy Ghost of God, when the purchase price was paid, Jesus Christ paid my redemption price. The Holy Ghost of God came and applied that purchase price to me. And he sealed me. And he sealed within an earthen vessel his great promise of redemption. And he's placed within me hope. And he's placed within me his power. And I want you to understand, I've been sealed he sealed this earthen vessel within. There's a mark within me. There's something within me called the Holy Ghost that shows me I belong to God. And there's a mark without. God is continually and sanctifying me and bringing me closer and closer to the image of Jesus Christ. There's an inner seal and an outer seal that the Holy Ghost has given. What a wonderful truth. Amen. And he's put that in an earthen vessel. You know, I was taught here that a clincher verse speaks about all that needs to be thought about when you come to a theme like this. And I thought of this clincher verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. The apostle writes, But we have this treasure in earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Jeremiah came to find out what I hope you come to find out. The Holy Spirit of God that lives within you will bring you to the same conclusion that Jeremiah came to in verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. 